I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel. This is a podcast episode brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Welcome back to our Bamid Bar series titled Community Between Order and Chaos, where we are exploring the gap between the vision for community laid out in Bamid Bar and the real life challenges to this order presented throughout the book. Each week, I'll be partnering with a communal leader from around the world to explore these themes. We will hear about their different challenges and responses, as well as our usual deep dive into these themes in the Parsha. To sponsor an episode, please contact me at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il or the Matan office. Parshat Balak is an incredibly unusual Parsha, told almost entirely from the perspective of an outsider, uh, really different than the Torah's general view. We learn how those outside of the Israelite nation viewed them. I see this Parsha as a really important reminder that once in a while, not too obsessively, it's important to understand how others view us. In the case that the external perspective doesn't match the individual intent, it might guide them to shift and tweak their efforts. However, in the case of the nation, as viewed in this week's Parsha, this Parsha has become the hallmark standard. The fear of the small Jewish population leads to a desire to eliminate us. I'm not sure how helpful the external perspective is in this case. With the help of God, though, the curse becomes a blessing. However, the phrase popularly lifted from the week's Parsha, Am Levadad Yishkon, that we are a nation that dwells alone, is in fact a curse. And while we are the subject of intense hate at this moment in time, the partnerships that have been created and miraculously sustained during this time and the war around us with other Middle Eastern countries is a beautiful testament to the curse's reversal. The Parsha ends with the episode of Israel's sexual and perhaps idolatrous sins with the women of Moab and Pinchas's zealous murder of one particular sinner. This will be the topic of today's conversation. My guest today, Ravioni Rosenzweig, is a community rabbi of the Netzach Menashe community in Beit Shemesh and the author of several books. He teaches Halakha, Gemara, and Machshava at Midrash at Lindebaum. He was, between the year 2006 to 2009, the Rosh Kola of the Mizracha community in Melbourne, Australia. And after this, he was also in Yeshivat HaMivtar and Yeshivat Shvut Yisrael and Efrat. In 2017, Ravioni Rosenzweig realized that there was significant dearth of published halachic materials on mental health and set about to rectify the situation with his good friend, Dr. Shmuel Harris. Together, they wrote Nafshi B'She'elati, a comprehensive halachic work on mental health published by Magid. Sensing the strong need for a center that would train Jewish community leaders, providing an address for those suffering uh, to fight stigma and raise awareness, Ravioni partnered with Nadav Ellenson, a high-tech executive, to found Magale Nefesh, the Center for Mental Health, Community, and Halakha. Ravioni Rosenzweig, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. So our topic today is really uh, going to sort of dig deep into the last portion of the Parsha. Uh, the beginning where we have Balak and Bil'am and, and that story is really somewhat different. Chazal, of course, have found a way where they connect the two parts of the story, saying that essentially uh, these women who eventually become uh, part of the, the big issue at the end were sent, uh, were sent by them. Uh, but our conversation today really is going to focus on, on that last piece. Uh, and so I'd love for you to sort of jump into that section and and also explain to us even possibly a little bit textually, like within the Psukim, uh, where you're going to bring us a reading uh, that I think is going to be different than many of us are maybe familiar with uh, on this last section. Right. So as you say, that story is uh, is very interesting from many perspectives. Of course, it's also split up between this Parsha and the next Parsha. There are questions about that and the role of Pinchas. Um, and and why the names are only mentioned in the next parsha, but we're not going to go into all of that. I, I want to focus really on one uh, very interesting point uh, that you see in the story, which is that um, what we see is that Moshe Rabbeinu uh, is commanded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to take care of things, right? So if you look at the uh, at the Psokim, um, you know, you see that, um, I'm going to quickly uh, quote over here, so like many other times in the Torah, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu asks Moshe Rabbeinu to take care of the situation. And he tells him also how to do it. You know, whatever the word Hokam means right now, it doesn't matter. You know, but the point is, yeah, take the heads of the people and, you know, the uh, which apparently has started, uh, the plague will stop. 
and then uh, you take care of it. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu should know how to do this, right? So he supposedly does. Uh, in the next Pasuk, Moshe El Shoftei Israel, he'll go ish anashav and it's vadim lebal peol. But this action taken by Moshe Rabbeinu, and, and naturally, I think what we would usually expect is to skip after Pasuk Hay to Pasuk Chet. And then it would say, meaning Moshe did it. And then, okay, then the Magifa stopped. But that's what we would expect. But instead, we have another three psokim here that discuss what Pinchas did. And the question is, why was Pinchas necessary? Did Moshe Rabbeinu not know what to do? Why is it that the Magifa, the plague, only stops after Pinchas's action? Uh, on the face of it, Moshe Rabbeinu is the leader, and he's the one, and he did it. So that that is a, a simple question. I think that anybody who reads this uh, story uh, asks themselves. What I think is is the beginning of an answer, and I'll reference just for your listeners uh, the interesting, um, uh, but you could say maybe even not not so important distinction. But I think it is important uh, between Benot Moav and Benot Midian, right? Where it seems like the woman who was with uh, Zimri was Midianit. In the beginning, it says, So once again, for your listeners, I'll just say it's interesting to look at the Hamek Davar, that it's Sivan this, you know, where he says, you know, which, which of Odazara belong to which nation? And, and what we see over here is that um, Bnot Moav probably, uh, you know, were involved with Bnot Midian in terms of doing this. One of them brought the Avodazara of their place, and the other one brought something else from their place. And we'll see what that is in a moment. Yeah, I'll just but, also add just from mo- most of, like I would say, even the more academic approach really assumes that there are sort of two tribes that traveled together, meaning that there was some general cross-pollination that happened between them because we have other places in Tanakh where they both get mentioned together. That's like some, one of the more... 100%. Approaches. Yeah. Um, but the salient point here uh, after all this is that interestingly, when Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu to take care of things, Moshe Rabbeinu asks Am Yisrael to kill what? Meaning that what it seems is that Moshe Rabbeinu um, viewed the problem as a Vodah Zara. And that may not be so surprising. Moshe Rabbeinu never had a different problem, right? We have the Egel, we have, uh, you know, other things. Bnei Israel have always been somewhat um, rebellious when it comes to belief in God. And that is true in, in several places before Bamidbar. And we've actually never had a situation before where Am Yisrael's sin is that they start to um, uh, uh, sleep with uh, women from another tribe or from another nation. That's a first over here. And Moshe Rabbeinu, when he is commanded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to take care of the situation, identifies the problem, as he maybe classically did, as a betrayal of God, in the sense that it's a vote of Zara. And that's why he says, Anitzmadim lebal peor. Go take care, right, of the people who are worshiping idols or worshiping another God. But if we look back for a second at the Psokim, at the beginning of this parak, right, it says, Vayeshev Israel Bashitim, Vayachel Am Liznot El Bnot Moav. And then it says in Pasuk Pe, Vatikrena La Am Lezivche Eloen, Vayochal Am Vishtachavul Eloen. So what do we see here? We see a progression. The beginning was actually Liznot el Bnot Moav. The first sin, the thing that started this whole thing, was actually um, a sim- in the sense of assimilation of sorts. So in other words, that Am Yisrael went and decided to sleep with the daughters of another nation and to be with them. And then Vatikren Allah'am. Then they called the people to go and eat from Zivchei Eloen, from the offerings that they gave to their gods. And then Vishtachavul Eloin. So the Avoda Zara was an, was an outcropping of the original sin. It wasn't the original sin in and of itself. It was a result of the original sin. It was a symptom. But the real sinfulness was Liznot El Benot Moav. That's what started it all. Right. I mean, another, I think another response or a parallel response to this is often that this was probably some sort of erotic worship. Meaning, and again, I think that your your I think your approach is 
is correct. But the approach that tries to say, well, they're not really two different things. They must be the same thing. And that's why Moshe said that, right? It sort of tries to harmonize these two pieces. And your approach is saying, no, let's keep them separate. Meaning it could be that it led to worship, but it's not necessarily that the actual sleeping with these, right? That, that, that idea sort of presents them as kind of like priestesses, right? That there's some sort of religious priestesses and it makes it all work together. But I think that your point is very important, which is that mm, the Torah presents them pretty clearly as as two two separate ideas. I'll also just say that as you're describing this, I'm kind of like imagining, and not in the graphic detail, but imagining like what this was like, meaning Amishal is traveling so it's such a solitary way. They've obviously just been, you know, cursed to be doomed to solitude for for the rest of history. And what does this mean? Meaning they're not, it's not like you're living in a city with other people and it's about like the red light district versus like when you when you think about this a little bit, it's Right. It, it's actually it. It feels even more horrific than than I really ever thought about it before because it's it's quite the act of deliberate going out of your encampment. Meaning, it's not like I can slink over and it's a city that bleeds into another area. But meaning, it's literally an act of of leaving. Right. It's it's much more like a yeah. much more dramatic version of of becoming involved uh, with, with others. Um, and then of course the brazen act that comes in a moment of, of two people actually engaging in this sexual way in like the central religious space of Am Yisrael, meaning it's, it's kind of mind boggling how, how it could have possibly right. gotten to that space at all. It's, it's so, it's so not secretive. Like I'm imagining, I was, I was reading recently, um, I'm in a Chaim Potak stream of a uh, of, uh, moment of, of my life. And in his book, The Book of Lights, where he speaks about a chaplain, a, a Jewish chaplain who goes in the Korean War and speaks about the very common thing we know about of soldiers in general finding uh, human solace in the local populations who also then sure. purposefully exploited them. And, and, and it's mama something similar, meaning to going from one moment like this, the army base to walk out, you know, a few steps and physically go and find that. And, and it, it's just, this feels even, this is different. They're living with their families in their tents, meaning the, the egregiousness of it, I feel like it's hitting me now in a way that's much stronger than when I've ever thought about this in the past. Right. Right. I completely agree with everything you said a hundred percent. And, and I add to that, what I said at the beginning, that this is basically the first instance, the first such instance that Am Yisrael has ever encountered, that the leaders of Am Yisrael ever encountered. You know, this was not something that they necessarily were very familiar with. So, um, yeah, it's it's a totally new reality uh, for them, you know, without a doubt. I think it, though, it does, and Chazal plan this in some subtle ways, I think it does, though, present the initial pairing between I don't even know, I wouldn't call it romance. It does present the initial correlation between a sexual relationship and and cultural, you know, assimilation. Sure. Meaning it, I think even if we look at those as two separate pieces, I think it does present a kind of model of, you know, of course that's the Midrash says that was exactly the the purpose from the point of of uh, of Bilam, who, you know, orchestrated this behind the scenes. But I think that 100%. that being said, it's like, you know, let's not remove our human, you know, shortcomings from the broader context that we find ourselves in. I think that that's an important piece. Right. Also. And in, and in Sefer Dvarim, of course, that's already Mephorosh. It's already, it's already explicit yeah. that marrying into other nations will lead you to uh, serve their gods as well. That's Mephorosh and Psukim and Dvarim. Yeah. And, and something we spoke about earlier in the series is this general idea how, how the book of Bamidbar has this um, funny relationship between law and narrative. And this is one of those great examples where the narrative show, explains to you how the law is then formulated. Meaning here's your example of why that had to be said straight out in Sefer Dvarim. Uh, because what we have a great example, even in this pretty disgusting example where they had to really go out so actively um, that shows you that this is, that this is alluring even under the most, uh, um, tenuous of times. So yeah, and I, and I would add just on a just on a on a like a more current note that uh, it's, it hasn't changed. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you. I mean, you can find many uh, sort of what they call them multi faith families or, or whatever you want to call them today. You know, it's the same. It's always the same thing. In other words, that that I think that piece of human nature hasn't changed. Once you marry uh, a person who holds a different set of beliefs or a different faith or whatever it is, then naturally you will also gravitate towards that and incorporate that in your life, you know, it's, uh, it's almost inevitable. Yeah. Okay. So where um, do we go from here? Right. So, so, uh, uh, Pinchas actually recognized this, right? What happens in the Psukim, the way I read them is that Pinchas actually understood what was happening in my, in my, the way I, I'm going to dramatize the story a little bit 
But, you know, like in my mind, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was getting maybe even frustrated. In other words, he says, He's orchestrating, you know, the killing of all these individuals who are over the Zara. The killing is happening, right? Am Israel is falling. And the Magifat doesn't stop. And the plague doesn't stop. And Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't understand what's going on, right? Like he's doing all these, he's doing all this thing that our Kaddish Baruch Hu asked him to do, all this bloodshed and nothing, nothing, nothing's, nothing's helping, nothing's stopping, it's continuing. You know, I assume that at that moment, right, it was quite frustrating. Uh, Chazal say it a little bit differently in a different context. You know, that in that moment when he saw the Midianite woman in Zimri, that he didn't know what to do. You know, halachically, theoretically, he didn't know what to do in that situation. Was he allowed to kill them? Not allowed to kill them? You know, but perhaps the the um, statement here of the of Chazal is indicative of an, of a general moment for Moshe Rabbeinu where he, he's helpless. He, he doesn't know what to do in the situation. He he thinks he understands what Hashem wants from him, and yet he's somehow not able to uh, curb whatever is happening and to stop the plague that has taken so many lives. And Pinchas takes a moment here, right, where he basically recognizes that the problem is in a different place, that everything that we're seeing is just a symptom. And what we need to do is we need to attack the root cause. What we need to do is not attack hanitzmadim lebal peor. We need to attack the people vayakreve chavet amidyanit, min elechavet amidyanit. The person who is sleeping with the Midianite woman, that individual, he is the root cause or a symbol, if you will, of the root cause. Understanding that, not only theoretically, like, right, you just killed one person. I mean, is that really the problem? Okay, what you've solved here is that you've solved the message that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to give on Israel, meaning that is symbolic, also in terms of the status of the individuals who were killed, but not only, right, but in terms of understanding, okay, what are we actually against over here? The problem is not just that out of this union or out of this action, you know, comes a vote of Zara. No, it's the action itself also is problematic. You cannot go around sleeping with Midianite women. It's not proper. It's not the right thing to do. And so once Pinchas attacks the root cause and delivers that message, then the Magifa really stops. Then the the um, uh, the issue is handled. I, I think I just so want that, to mention one piece about the Rashi Ha'am, right? Because you mentioned earlier that it's not totally clear who we're targeting, right? Are we targeting, in the right. beginning, Hashem says to Moshe to take Rashi Ha'am, but we also know that other people are sinning. So there, there's this question that comes up in all the Parshanut and certainly all modern commentators of who's the problem? Is it the leaders? Is it the people? It seems to be that it's more than the leaders because right, so many people die in, in the plague. So if we're going with this assumption that's the guilty people who are dying, then it seems to be that there is the cloud that's sinning. But as you said, the, the, the statement they want the statement to be made with the Nasi'im, right? Or those kind of leaders who are falling. The point isn't to, is that they have to physically kill every single person, but they want to have, as you said, like a, a symbolic uh, death, if you could, I mean, a symbolic uh, ceasing of this sin. And I'm just thinking, you know, if you isolate for a moment the involvement, mistakes, pitfalls of of the leaders throughout Sefer Bar, like we had a high moment where they're bringing, you know, these these uh, matanot, these gifts to the to the mikdash, but we have, you know, the miraglim who were leaders in their own right, and we have the nisi mentioned earlier in here, and this correlation between the failings of the leaders versus what how the people are following them, uh, without giving any sort of resolution, I think is an interesting point to think about because here they kind of get mushed together, and then Pinchas is able to separate them and say we need to get rid of that particular leader, um, and and this idea that you know we think a lot about Moshe and Aaron and. Their leadership, but we don't think as much about how the Nisim were obviously some sort of real, they were real leaders in, in the Midbar. And I think this story, while we don't usually focus on it, is, is this moment here where you see that the, of, of, of all the jobs they probably held, they were supposed to be symbolically representational of the people. Here it was done very negatively, but in theory, they're supposed to embody the people that they that they represent. And I'll just add the piece that I think we always, we know 
but this idea that we have here sort of like the final fall of Shevet Shimon, um, that, that this is that piece where we finally see how, you know, uh, uh, the, the fates of Levi and Shimon, which were initially fused in the end of Sefer Breshit, here officially part ways. They part ways also before we see in the census that Shimon is starting to sort of uh, uh, a little bit fall apart in terms of their numbers. And, and Chazal also have some, there's some great Midrashim that speak about this idea of how here is where, you know, Shimon really, really lost it for the final time. And it's after this that they're not really able to ever fully recover. And of course, their Nachala gets fused with the Nachala of, of Yehuda. Just wanted to remind us all of this. There's a, there's a story embedded in the story here. There's a dialogue here. Sure. Your pizza is about Shimon. Sure. A hundred percent. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, we can learn from here, you know, I think a significant, a, a significant lesson, which I'm not, I'm not sure it repeats itself in many other stories, actually, in the Torah, you know, because usually the hero of the story um, attacks the problem head on, you know, and deals with it, right? So what we have here is actually, I think, quite unique um, in terms of the Tanakh stories or Torah stories anyway, which is someone who is, you know, the leader, uh, you know, gets a direct seal from a, a direct commandment from a, from Hashem, doesn't know what to do with it. In other words, you know, attacks a certain aspect of the issue of the problem, right? But doesn't uh, doesn't attack the root cause. And I think that the the, the distinction between symptom and cause here is of, of great significance to us because you know we can see this also throughout Tanakh, also throughout Chazal, also just throughout the world whether it's in education, whether it's in politics and other places, I mean, the idea of, of symptomology, of attacking the symptoms, you know, I, I marvel at it every single time, right? The idea that sometimes people believe, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not referring to any specific uh, individual here, um, but the fact that people think sometimes, that, like I said, in politics and education and other uh, systems, that if you get rid of an individual, for example, that you will fix the problem. You know, the, the individual many times is just a, uh, manifestation, you know, of a, of a certain root issue, which the next person who comes along might uh, manifest as well. So the question is, are you dealing with the symptom, meaning with the practical, you know, um, showing of that problem, or um, are you actually dealing with the root cause? And I think this has a lot of important applications. I think maybe one application which will probably uh, bring us a little bit closer to some of the things that you deal with on a daily basis, I'll just say now that what's fascinating is that because of the way that education worked and the specializing and subspecializing that people do in so many fields, over, I would say, probably a century and a half, we really moved to like a very microscopic kind of way of, of functioning, right? As you said, it's, we're looking at the issue and the sub issue and there's a physician and they specialize in like, you know, the left side of the left kidney, right? Meaning we, in order to develop expertise, um, in many fields, we often lose the forest for the tree or the forest for the leaf on one tree. And what's interesting is that at least in the world of medicine, which I know we're getting a little bit closer to what you deal with, at least in the world of medicine, uh, there has been, while we don't necessarily experience it on a daily basis in the Kupat Cholim necessarily in Israel, there has been in the past, I would say 15 years, a major renaissance in the in the desire to look at the broader system and to realize that the 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 price we paid for a specialization, especially in the world of medicine, is that we lost figures who can actually see the big picture. Uh, that was the, of, of the human, of the person they're trying to treat. That's always been the greatest contribution of alternative medical practices, which never agreed to go down the route of subspecialization. This is no judgment, just a descriptive of the process. And sure. And I'll even say, by the way, that one of the biggest renaissances in Torah learning in the religious world has been this piece also, is that for so many generations, we did the microscopic, I'm going to take Rashi, separate it or any commentary and look at, you know, the tiny piece of this pasuk. And one of the best things that really breathed new life into Torah learning, so many people will identify it as like, you know, Gush Etzion or Har Etzion or whatever. Of course, they were the religious application of what was actually going on in the academic world. But this idea of let's look at the broad picture. Let's look at the themes of the parak, right? Again, they were really an outgrowth of literary study, but it doesn't matter. Those are 
or the weeds of this whole thing. But, and, and it really breathed new life into Tanakh learning in particular, because we had applied, like I would say, Talmudic thinking to Tanakh. And it's actually not always the most meaningful way to study Tanakh. Um, that's certainly the world that I come from, right? Of more like the broad thematic um, kind of space. And of course, you need the microscopic to make legitimate claims about the broad pieces. You cannot substitute one for the other. But I think that there's a bit more of an organic perspective that's emerged certainly in in, in in some worlds of Torah study. And I think that it's interesting how they parallel some of like the, the medical pieces. If any of what I'm saying is gibberish, I just encourage anybody to like do a little <laughs> bit of Googling. Um, these, these medical worlds are one I hang out with, but I don't share on the podcast. No, I think that's a fantastic point, really. I mean, like, uh, and I think you're absolutely right. Exactly what you said. Meaning I think that uh, most, uh, you know, if we looked, uh, look a little bit about the history, right? So m- most uh, Torah scholars, historically. We're not uh, Tanakh scholars, meaning Tanakh was not learned as its own thing, right? People learned, many times people learned Tanakh out of the out of the Gemara. In other words, yeah. they knew the Gemara, they knew the sources, they knew the Midrashim, and they even interpreted the Tanakh that way. Uh, even though we have quite a few Mepharshim, quite a few commentaries on Tanakh, in the grand scheme of things, there are very few. In other words, when you look at how many Gemara scholars there are, mm-hmm. and how many people have written on uh, the Gemara on the the outgrowths of the, the Ushalmi, others you know etc. There's certainly more than uh, on, on the Tanakh, but uh, 100%. We when we learn Tanakh as its own uh, discipline um, and we look at it from a bird's eye view, then we can see so many things that we couldn't see before. Um, and Chazal in general, especially you see this in the mid, in the Midrashim, we're not even trying to look at at a bird's eye view of the Tanakh. Their goal was to look at it as a as a book of Musar. Of Machshava, uh, we can learn lessons from this, right? If Avram Avinu, you know, served the three angels, then we can learn, uh, you know, Bikor Cholim from them, or we can learn Moshe, we can learn Bikor Cholim, but from him we can learn Gilut Chasadim, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The 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 way that Chazal looked at the Torah was as a book that teaches us lessons um, in a broader sense, rather than in a in a more specific sense, what the story itself actually means. And therefore, now learn from that what it can tell us. Uh, it's a whole different thing, for sure. I agree. So, Ravioni, I'd love if you would explain to to our audience a little bit about how you moved from. I mean, you're still a Rav of a Kihila in Beit Shemesh. Well, how you went from sort of being a Rav of a Shul in Beit Shemesh to really starting to cater to quite a particular niche in the halachic world. And I'll also just say that you know, attention to the world of of mental health. It's so interesting how. It, meaning halacha has had to sort of uh, come up to pace with uh, with technology, right? It's come up, it's had to come up to pace with all different uh, all different developments in the modern world, and and the and the niche that you have, I would even say, created is, I mean, obviously we wish that it didn't exist, but it does exist and always has existed, and people have always needed attention to uh, mental health and. And I'm just I'm curious how you moved into that space into the world of of helping these kinds of of difficulties that people face. Right. So as a community rabbi, you know, I get a lot of different kinds of questions. And over the years, I've received very few, by the way, but I received uh, you know questions also about mental health. And in about around 2017, 2018, uh, I I looked around because I received a few questions uh, about this on a halachic format. Um, I looked around to see what answers there were, and I realized that there was like a real dearth of, of material on this. And um, I wanted to see if that gap could be closed. So together with Dr. Shmuel Harris, um, who's a psychiatrist, you know, we really looked into the, we spent four years, we wrote a book. Uh, the book became an idea for a nonprofit uh, that deals with mental health in the Jewish, um, in the Jewish world. And, um, you know, it's there's just such a need. The feedback that I have received from the community as a result um, of this activity has been unbelievable because it just, there's almost no one to turn to, or people, at least that's how they feel, but there's almost no one to turn to um, in terms of navigating the gap um, between uh, living a, a good, healthy Jewish Orthodox life um, and between caring for your mental health. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, you know, I'm not religious because of my mental health struggles. I didn't think that I could be religious and also do that. 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. I've never heard that with physical health. No one's ever said to me that they're no longer religious because they thought they couldn't care for their physical health and at the same time remain religious. Right. You know, so in terms of that, right, that was, uh, you know, a very, very um, uh, clear signpost for me that this was something that I needed to be doing. Can you just give us an example of some of the questions that you deal with, whether it's in the book or what kind of questions come? Sure, to you? sure. Of course. Um, I get so many kinds of questions, you know, people who are suffering from depression or eating disorders or borderline personality disorder want to know if they can use their phone on Shabbos. The phone many times is a coping mechanism. It's hard for us. Uh, if we don't go through it, it's hard for us to understand it. But it's a significant coping mechanism for them to listen to music or to watch something. Um, and they can't do it on Shabbat and it cause a deterioration. Um, but yeah, let's, using their phone on Shabbat, for example, respecting parents who have uh, been abusive, right? Is there a keyboard of AM? Is there not a keyboard of AM? Fasting, coming up on Yud Zayn Batamos, Tisha B'Av, Yom Kippur, some good are coming up on all the fasts now. You know, someone with an eating disorder, should they fast? Should they not fast? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those sorts of questions. Uh, questions of Lashon Hara and therapy, questions of OCD and Halacha. Uh, washing hands, davening, um, kashrus questions, etc. Uh, depression and need as well. Women or men who are suffering from depression and they need a hug uh, while the wife is in nida. You know, can they get that hug? Or can they give that hug to the wife if she is suffering from depression? Um, you know, etc. Uh, yeah, so many questions. So we're going to get back to the people, right? The humans themselves in a minute. But I guess I'm curious to ask you, you know, you were working in the world of halacha, you're a rav for many years before this. Um, going through this process, writing these chuvot, which again, to clarify, meaning you're you're writing it as a serious halachic shoot, right? As a serious halachic sure. responsa, right? You're coming in with the erudition of being a rav. This is, our, you know, the, the source basedness is, of course, super important for these to be precedents for the future. And then everybody else who's reading them is, is able to, you know, judge whether they agree with the conclusion or, or of course, be a source if... Uh, um, for the, in their own communities. I guess I'm curious if you, di- if you feel like you discovered something new about the halachic system through, through writing this book, I'll, I'll clarify with an example. Many women will tell me that in, you know, my work as a halacha, and I can even say this about myself, that I feel that, um, that they, that this is from a non-scholarly scholarship perspective, that they felt like they discovered that how the world of halacha can be empathic and they never had reason to discover it in other realms of their life. And then they get to this realm of whether it's everything that can come up in the world of, of women's bodies and health, but they feel like they discovered a new part of halacha. I'm curious if, whether from the human perspective or even from the the scholarship that you, that you had to study, if you feel like you, 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 you found something new or renewed in the world of halacha. Right. The answer is yes, but it's hard on a podcast to uh, explain it. Uh, as you say, it is, it is a scholarly sort of, uh, you know, like um, uh, enlightenment that, that a person has. For that, I'd have to show sources and show what I mean. But uh, nevertheless, the answer is yes. I do believe that, uh, spe- and I'll try to explain it here in short, that specifically with mental health, where the issue that is involved is impossible to really see or to really understand for the POSEC who's not going through it, um, that there is an ability to show empathy and there is an ability to paskin, not just to show empathy as a human being, but to paskin also in a way that is taking into account uh, the subjective personal experience of the individual. And, and uh, we have a, uh, even the ability, and this is what's really important, to see into the future. In other words, what I mean by that is that with mental health, usually the individual is not right now in a state of, let's say, pikuach nefesh, let's say life-threatening. But any person who understands the trajectory of what this person is going through will understand that eventually they will get to that. The ability of the Allah to look into that future and then to decide, okay, so we're going to be mekel now, we're going to be lenient now. So the person doesn't reach that place, right? That also, on some level, is a, is a chiddush. You know, it's something new that comes out of of this field on some level. Right. Interesting. You're saying because halacha for for in most cases 
deals with the situation in, in front of us, right? You have this pot or yeah. that pot. You have, you know, this, there's bleeding, there's no bleeding, but we're dealing with both illnesses that are invisible to the naked eye. And the halachic scenario is also not actually manifest right now in front of our eyes. So that, and many that. times that's true. So uh, another question I want to ask is what you have maybe discovered about humans. Uh, for your work, right? You were working with humans before. You were working with uh, with halacha and community. Uh, I'm curious what you've discovered about about humans, possibly in the past, you know, six or so years that you've been doing. Right. So I think that this is intimately connected. With what we were talking about before in terms of the difference in symptoms uh, and causes, and uh, there we're talking about it in a negative sense. But I also think that this is true in a positive sense. In other words, when it comes to people with mental health challenges, and especially this is true for people who have not. Uh, either experience it themselves or have family members, uh, you know, who have that, is that we look at the outside behavior. We look at the person, look at the symptoms, the symptomology. Um, and a lot of times we are fooled by that, you know, because people who are um, unwell, you know, uh, uh, mentally um, make us feel awkward, maybe scare us. Uh, maybe we don't know how to act around them. Uh, you know, they act in ways that are sometimes unclear to us or unexpected to us, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And this has caused, I think, uh, first of all, an over pathologization of mental health to the extent that people say, oh, you must go to the doctor, you must do this, must do that. When a lot of times the, uh, I'm not saying they shouldn't uh, see a therapist, but, you know, a lot of times we, the community, have a lot that we can do and a person you know, can live in that community and be part of that community. But beyond that, what we're missing out, and this is tragic to me, you know, is, is like I said, the root of who the person is. The, the symptomology is one thing, but the person, right, the inside of the person, the essence of the individual, it becomes very, very beautiful, very, very tender and davka because sometimes it's, it's, it's a direct, in direct correlation to the mental health challenge the person has gone through. It's, it's, that um, it's that uh, pain and suffering and, and the trials and tribulations that the person has gone through that make them sensitive to pain and make them sensitive to human suffering. Um, and they have a lot that they can give and a lot that they can contribute uh, if society just allowed them to. I mean, you just saw not just what's broken sometimes in the person, but what's actually there that wasn't, that isn't there in any other person. Uh, the unique perspective, the unique feelings, um, the abilities. Uh, there's a lot of that. The more that I um, um, delve into the world of mental health, the more I realize that even individuals, once again, the terms of their behavior may sometimes be abrasive, may sometimes be you know, hurtful or difficult to speak to. But if you get over that, if you just get over that hump, if you spend a little bit more time, if you befriend them, despite all that, right? You'll find such a tender soul, such a such a beautiful person inside. You know, such a there's a lot there, a lot there. And I think that if we are able to find uh, a path uh, towards uh, seeing that and and incorporating such individuals in our community, we can benefit greatly, greatly in my opinion. You know, as I'm thinking sort of of the past stories in Sefer Bamidbar, when I when I invited you to participate in the series, I actually thought you might choose like, um, you know, Peraktet, like the Tameim who are outside the encampment and, you know, how we incorporate them in. Or I was thinking of like entry entry points to this series that you might choose. Okay. And and I what I'm moved by in this in this conversation is, first of all, that this is not a case. Let's e let's even say like Pesach Sheni, which has become you know a flagship for particularly in the LGBTQ right. world, um, in, in, in within the Jewish context. And uh, but in though in that in that let's say particular vignette, you have those who are excluded who then advocated to come back in. I think that what's unique about what you've done is that the, your initiative is Dafka, a leadership down, uh, meaning you've heard the people, you heard what they need, and you said, well, this needs to be here so that we can embrace and everybody can feel like they have a place. And I think there's always room in every issue to have grassroots versus leadership. But I think that that specific piece that you're coming in Dafka as the rabbinic leader, as the rabbinic representative, and saying there's space for everybody, and these are people who are going to also enrich the way we look at 
humanity, right? The way we experience humanity. Um, and, and, and they have what, and they, they are us, right? It's not us or them. It's not a, 100%. as I said, those examples before. And I was surprised. And then when you sent me your points about this Parsha, I was wondering what was the, what was going to be the connection. So I really appreciate that. It's such like an organic entryway into, into these ideas that you're, that you're working with. Um, and I think that, as you said, it's a, it's an ailment that we're suffering from in so many realms, this idea of looking at the symptoms as opposed to the the root cause. Uh, and, and I would also say that when we focus on the symptoms, we usually we usually lose out because the symptoms are very overwhelming very often, whether it's, as you said, in the political system or it's an educational system. Uh, I was just recently in a talk of between a, you know, Haredi leader and a, a different societal leader. And then someone says, but what about the details? You're saying these big ideas, but the details are so complicated. And, and the person speaking said, you're right, but I don't agree with you. Because if you look at it from the perspective of the details, you'll never go forward. If you have to look at it sometimes from the general sense, or in this case, you're saying root cause, which isn't the same as general, but I think it's somewhat of a related perspective sure. because otherwise we'll just lose it and we'll never go anywhere. So uh, I think that that's such a valuable perspective. And I appreciated that that entryway into the Torah, Dafka through through symptoms versus versus root cause. Thank you. Um, and I'll just, I'll just add one, th one quick thing, which is just in terms of what you just said, right? Because when you do look at it from like Tme'im Lanefesh and, you know, it's at a second chance, Pesach Sheni, then a lot of times the, 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 react, the, the context is such as basically we're saying, oh, like those poor people and we're going to let them in and all that stuff. And it's not a, a like, oh, like we can gain from this, you know? But that, that's what I think is really going on here with the mental health aspect of it is it's not just, oh, let's make room for these people. We really need to. They're part of it. Yes, it's also that. But at the end of the day, the people who will be enriched, the people who will gain is not just them. It's also us. Ravioni Rosenzweig, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and introducing your really, really important work to uh, all of our listeners. And so I want to remind them that your book is called... Nafshi B'Shelati. Nafshi B'Shelati. Of course, a beautiful quote from Miguel Atastere. Um, and uh, and you can find that at all um, I, uh, all bookstores that I've ever been at or selling it. Of course, you can order it online. And you can also right. check out the website of Magale Nefesh to see the different programs that they run in the communities. Uh, I have a whole bunch of friends who've taken part in them and felt that they were extremely enriched in their work with people. Uh, so um, so it's really uh, such a service to all of Am Yisrael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode from Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. If you would like to sponsor an episode, please contact the Matan office or email me at podcast.matan.org.il. Please do us and all women's Torah learning a favor and share this episode with all of your friends and family.